Um, my name is Stephen Pike. I work in uh, research and innovation services, um, and in particular, uh, my role is looking at commercialisation opportunities. So that's really just one aspect of uh, of intellectual property. Um, I look after engineering engineering faculty. Um, so rather than just talk about commercialisation, I just give you. Uh, really a brief introduction to what we actually mean by the term intellectual property or intellectual property rights. So what is intellectual property rather than me trying to define it? This is the definition I've pulled off the UK Intellectual Property Office. So the UK Intellectual Property Office looks after patents, trademarks, design rights, copyrights, etc. So basically it is a very broad term intellectual property. It really com comes any sort of creative thought idea, creative work, it, it's a very broad term but, and, and the key part about it is with, with IP it means it describes ownership to, to something <coughs> and once you have ownership it also gives the opportunity that those, those rights can be bought and can be sold by other people and can be traded. That's really the sort of key principles around intellectual property and intellectual property rights. I mean, there are various types of intellectual property that you maybe need to consider and, and probably in the context of this viral challenge, but also in the context of your, of your own research going forward. Um, and also in a commercial sense, it, it's probably easier if I just run through what this, rather than this clever animation. So on the left hand side we have um, intellectual property that is applied for, and typically those, those are the sort of areas of intellectual property that we'd be very familiar with, so things like patents, trademarks, registered designs, but they're also intellectual property that legally have standing just through their through their creation, and typically, um, and those would be copyright and design rights. So a, a creative work, whether it's a song, a written piece, the copyright exists <coughs> from the moment you create that you create that work. So there's no need to apply for it, whereas these you actually do need to make a formal legal application through the Intellectual Property Office for your patent, for your trademark, to register your trademark, to register your design. And then commercially there's a range of other intellectual properties and these more generally would be under the, the, under the blanket of trade secrets, know-how. So those if you're Coca-Cola, possibly rather than registering your recipe so that everyone can copy it, you keep it very top secret within the the walls of your company and share the recipe with very few people. So that would be something like a trade secret, or maybe know-how in the terms of, in, in, in the sense of how you, you actually go about making something. But I think probably the area that we're going to, just a little bit to focus on today, just really on, on these, the rights that have some sort of legal attachment to them. So copyright, and I guess that's of interest for those sending out viral videos, is that certainly with all the University of Sheffield presentations, we have that little copyright symbol, so that does define that we are asserting our copyright and ownership of, of a creative work, and that would be true, you may need to think about that if you're sending out viral videos, that you might want a, a non-deletable copyright symbol to assure that we know who the ultimate owner is. Um, another point about ownership of, uh, of intellectual property is intellectual property it, it implies ownership and, and who actually owns it. So in legal terms, you as the creator of any intellectual property are the owner of it. Um, also, if, or if, whether you, if you've bought that intellectual property or the rights <coughs> from someone else, you are the owner of it. Um, but, and this applies to you as registered research students as well as employees, but typically if you're employed by a company or if you're employed by the university, the university or your company employer will own the intellectual property that you create. And that actually is true as a registered PhD student. The university asserts rights and actually owns the IP coming out of your research program. That's a point to note. So, actual registered intellectual properties, what, what, what is protected? So for patents, it's the, the technical principle, how something works. Um, for registered designs, it's essentially the appearance, the appearance of something, and it must be a distinctive appearance that you can define in, a, in your design or your registration <coughs> application. And a trademark really just defines the source or the brand who actually supplies this particular product. 
So generally in the university when we talk about intellectual property and the sorts of things we can, we can protect and consider commercialising, the key for us generally would be can we put a patent on it? That really gives, from a research point of view, the best protection for us to actually be able to commercialise, to be actually be able to trade our intellectual property. So what can actually can be patented? And there's really four key criteria, and there's, there's particular ones that are actually important to you as a researcher to start thinking about now that now you're doing research and you may well be creating intellectual property that might, you might want to consider patenting at some point in the future. So the first part is news, so it's not in the public domain, so your idea must essentially, in any, any publication, you know, whether that be journals, trade papers, more generally the sort of open literature, but also things like websites, blogs, if the information that you wish to protect is already out of the public domain and can be found in the public domain, then it, it excludes it. It's already counted as being disclosed, so you, you can't patent. You must also be able to, uh, bearing in mind what's already out there and what's known and what's in the state of the art, you also need to be able to demonstrate that your idea is inventive. There is actually an inventive step. It's not obvious to someone who's already skilled in your particular field of research. Um, so there must be a, a non-invent, a non-obvious step to what you've done. Um, third point is your invention must be capable of industrial application. I it must can't just be an idea. It must have, it actually must have a real, real-world use. Um, there are various excluded categories from uh, patenting. So these might be things like discoveries. So yeah, so discoveries. You must be able to demonstrate that you know you can discover a new molecule. But if you're not actually demonstrating it has a real-world application, whether it's as a new drug or a new adhesive or whatever it might be, then what you would claim is its properties as that drug or as, as that adhesive, rather than just, I claim, a new molecule. Um, other exclusions, things like mathematical methods. Again, the, the same distinction applies there. Uh, a mathematical method in its own right, or an algorithm in its own right, is not patentable unless you can demonstrate you are applying it and using it to have a technical effect at the end of it. And there are also one or two other exceptions, such as things like medical procedures that are decided, uh, deemed unethical for, for protection and preventing others from, from doing your particular medical procedure. So just a couple of examples here, yeah, of objects that might embody patented IP. So that particular molecule, as I say there, it, what you would really be claiming would be not that molecule in itself, but the effect that that molecule can have for whether it be as a drug or some other application. Um, famous example of a company that gets very involved and quite litigious in IP is, is Dyson. And a good example there is just in a single vacuum cleaner, vacuum cleaner there is just what range of IP might be included in there. So you've probably got almost certainly, you know, at least a dozen patents applying to various aspects of that technology, but you've also probably got registered design rights there that would protect Dyson from having others manufacture vacuum cleaners that look like theirs. You will also have trademarks applied to it. So there's a, there's a range of IP, typically, that ultimately when you get into commercial production that, that applies. But certainly, it, for our terms as a university, typically we're talking about patented IP and potentially copyright as well. Um, just a little bit of a talk. I won't go into the whole details because it's a subject for a much longer talk than today, but patent application. Um, one of our jobs in the university is to look at patentability. Um, but one of the key questions we always have to ask ourselves before we, we go down the route of applying for patents is, is you know, what's the justification for it? Because it is quite an expensive process and once you set the clock ticking on a patent, um, it doesn't stop. You are following the timelines of the patent office. So typically if you are looking to file a patent, just within the first five years alone, and most of that cost will be on the day that you file your patent, you are looking at an expenditure of at least three and a half thousand and quite often, if it's a very complex patent that's involved a lot of patent attorney time to write it, you might be spending six, seven K. And typically, as your development project progresses, you might well think, well, just protection in the UK is fairly limiting to what I want to do. I want to, to get my protection on a far more global basis. So that might be in Europe, might be USA, might be in the Far East. And then once you're doing that, your patent bill is going to go up to 30, 40, 50 K. Um, so, point to bear in mind with this and, and the work we do at the university that before embarking on filing a patent, it's not just on the basis that you've got a very clever idea and you want to protect it. 
is actually that you've got a commercial plan in place and you've actually got an idea of, of what you're going to do with this patent once filed and once you've committed the university to spending money to protect it. Um, just a few comments quickly. I won't obviously spend a great deal of time talking about the whole commercialisation system within the university, but just a few comments as to why the university would support commercialising research. You know, because some might say, well, we're a research institute, we receive all this public funding, should we just be going out there and telling the world what we do and giving it away for, for free effectively? But there are some reasons why the university would support and encourage you to think about the commercial opportunities that might come from your research. So in some of those I've listed here, what might they be? Um, many people, I'm sure Ian will be one here, have been heavily involved in something called the the REF assessment, which is a, effectively a, a UK-wide assessment of our research excellence and of our research impact. Um, and a key way of demonstrating the impact of your research is through a spin-out company. And there are a number of examples in the, the submission that the university put in this time round, where you can actually demonstrate that a piece of research that has gone into a spin-out, and that spin-out is now employing people, making money, and, and providing a, a benefit to the UK economy. So that's one example. Reputational benefits. You know, there are quite a number of local spin-outs that demonstrate to the local community around here that we're doing useful and actual applied research that is going into the real world. It's employing a significant number of people locally, well in excess of 100 people locally would be employed by University of Sheffield spin-outs. So it might even be a potential graduate employer for yourselves in the future. Um, it helps us in our writing of uh, translational funding bids that we we have a plan and we have an understanding of how we can take our research into market. And actually, spin-outs themselves are actually quite significant funders back into the university of, of further research. So it's another way of, of spawning new research opportunities, new research funding. Um, as individuals, why might you want to consider the commercial opportunities arising from your research? Well, that's not <coughs> significant that the university has a generous uh, mechanism to pay you should your uh, research get licensed and we bring royalties back in. Um, in future it might increase your opportunities to get further research funding. The very fact that you engage with industry and, and, and talk to industry and understand what are the industry needs, it can give you uh, some useful uh, contacts there. And I think also the feedback you'll get from industry if you do consider commercialisation gives you uh, a greater awareness of what, why you do your research and possibly how you might realign some of your research activity to be more commercially interesting. Um, so employment opportunities, there's also other good commercial uh, career reasons why you might want to engage in commercialisation because I would guess the vast majority of postgraduate researchers are not going to be staying in academia and, and having gone through an exercise of looking at commercial prospects of research is, is going to be useful for your future career. Um, and possibly even if you get directly engaged within the spin-outs, the, the, the interest there in terms of actually turning your uh, initial research idea into a, into a real-world product could be a, a satisfying and exciting thing to be doing. So that's probably all I was going to say about commercialisation, other than one thing to say here that we have a system in the university <coughs> support that, that's run through the uh, Research and Innovation Services commercialisation section which is where I work. Um, there's a, an online form there you can contact us with and I will, if you're in engineering or if it's one of the other faculties, one of my colleagues will come out and we'll go through with you and try and help you understand what might be the market interest in your product, how we as a university can potentially help you fund that, develop it further and engage commercial interest. Um, that's probably really all I was going to say. A little bit about IP, what IP is what it does, what you should and shouldn't do if you want to patent and those sorts of things. Um, and a little bit about the support that the university gives if you do feel there might be a commercial opportunity arising from your research.